let's keep diving into one point um section chapter one with the last and final section 1.4 okay we're gonna be using the definitions of trig functions to help us solve and evaluate okay um reciprocal we're gonna talk about reciprocal identities signs and ranges of function values Pythagorean identities and quotient identities so in the last section you were using x's and y's and r right now we're going to focus on using those more in terms of sine, cosine, tangent, and their reciprocal function. Got it? All right. So up first, um, these are your reciprocal identities. Okay? So reciprocal identity means that these are the ones that are opposite to each other. So if I know one, then I know the other. So for sine theta, it's reciprocal is one over cosine theta. That means I can substitute sine theta with one over um, cosecant theta, right? Um, or cosine theta is one over secant theta. For tan theta is one over cotangent theta. For cosecant theta, it is one over sine theta. And for secant theta is one over cosine theta. And cotangent theta is one over tan theta. There are your reciprocal identities. It's the same concept that we use with x, x y, and r, right? For sine, it's reciprocal was cosecant, right? And all we did was reciprocate the fraction. The same thing is taking place here. It's just in terms of the actual trig values. Okay. This is useful if you're using a calculator that doesn't have your reciprocal identities on it, but it does have sine, cosine, and tangent. So if I had to use a calculator to find cosecant of an angle, but that calculator doesn't have cosecant, then I would do one over sine theta. If you're giving information and you're solving, but yeah, it's substitution. Things that can it can be substituted in. Okay. All right. So up first, it's that we have cosine theta given that secant theta equals five over three, right? Um, our secant theta it equals five over three. What is the relationship between cosine theta and secant theta? They're reciprocals, right? So these two are reciprocal. All right. Um so y'all know like your teacher is a slight nerd, right? Um, just slightly, right? So we know we have sine, cosine, and tangent, right? Its reciprocals are cosine, sine, cotangent, right? So when I learned this, I was like really die hard into Harry Potter. Um, and so I don't know if y'all know in Harry Potter, he can speak to snakes right? right and so i decided the way i remember this was in me speaking to snakes um yeah so i remember that And so in my mind, it just helped me remember, and that's just from here on out, how I look at it, I think of it in terms of how can I be a saint? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's how I remember who goes with what. Um, but also remembering that every S has a C, okay? Um, your S's will never be together, your C's will never be together, all right? Um, it's just how I, rem how I remember. Um, but and the reason being is because when I looked at this, hold on, I, I'm trying to just let me be 10th grade me and bask in my nonsense. Party. Huh? Party. <laughs> uh, so like, if you look at it, you can see at the end. Oh, I didn't hear the, the cut. Yeah, I had to get the cut out, but I think I didn't write it out for you, me to say it correctly in my brain. And then I just remember. <laughs> and so in my mind, you know, 10th grade me, it was just like, oh, yeah, Harry Potter. And that's just how I remembered it. And it helped me. Uh, but I just want to show you all one of my dorkiest oh, moments, probably so in a math class. So yeah. So Kato is easy. The sine, cosine, tangent, right? But I need to make sure I remember the order of his reciprocals. And yeah. So anyways, um, cosine. Cosine reciprocal is secant. That means that they are reciprocated. I'm flipping their values, right? So if I know that they are reciprocals, 
I can easily identify what my cosine theta had to be, right? So if secant theta is five over three, then cosine theta equals what? Three over five. That's the beauty of knowing who reciprocates what. As long as I know who my reciprocal is, I can easily find everything else. So using the fraction is just making you show that identity through the trig value. So saying that um, if I know secant theta equals one over, sorry, I wrote it backwards. So I guess I'm supposed to teach you like the whole reason. So if I know cosine theta equals one over secant theta, I then am going to substitute what secant theta is, which is one over five thirds. And then you do the math. You keep changing flip. Because mm -mm. as long as you understand that in the end, you're doing what? You're going to flip it, right? So that's going to end up being your reciprocation of it. Okay. Now, if you need to go through the whole reciprocal rule, substitute, multiply, change, flip, it's all there. But that's the math that's taking place, okay? Now, from here, it also can tell you what your x, y, and r are, okay? So cosine theta, we know that cosine theta equals x over r, correct? So therefore, my x is 3, and my y is, and my r is, Five. Could I find my y if it asked me what is the point that this lies at? I could, right? Because now I have the values to plug in and then solve for y. And that's where it goes back to the x squared plus y squared equals r squared. I plug in what I know. I know 3 squared plus y squared equals 5 squared. This is a Pythagorean triple. So if I have 3 and 5, what does y have to be automatically? Anyone has caught on to that pattern? It has to be four. If I have three and five, it's missing. Pythagorean is always going to be four. Those are called triplets. Um, because nine plus 16 equals 25. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, those are called Pythagorean triples. They're going to always be the same. So no matter what, if I see that I have X and R as three and five, I know that Y is four. Same thing with your um, bell ringer today. You had 12 and 5. You're going to always get 13 as your hypotenuse, right? That math isn't going to change. It's still going to be 12 squared plus 5 squared equals 13 squared. So if I see 12 and 5 in my brain, I know automatically my R is 13 without having to do Pythagorean theorem every single time. So when you start seeing those patterns, those are called your Pythagorean triples. They're going to always be the same values, okay? My teacher made us memorize them. So I'm not doing that to y'all, but my teacher did make us memorize. All right, up next, we have sine theta, given that cosine theta equals negative square root of 12 over two. Okay, so again, what's the relationship between sine and cosecant? They are reciprocals. So um, again, I will be the good teacher and write it out. So we know sine theta equals one over cosecant theta. So therefore, we have 1 over negative square root of 12 over 2. I'm going to keep change flip, and that ends up being what? Negative 2 over the square root of 12, right? All right, this is not in its simplest form. And it's not also what? What am I not doing? Dual credit. Anyway yeah, time. it's dual credit. Um, it's up to you, sir. All right, so square root of 12. We got to ratify it, right? Yeah. How do I ratify? I never thought that. Okay, let's talk about it. In order to ratify, this has to be in its simplest form. So square root of 12, let's oh, I have to break it down. Double. Yeah, but is it in its simplest form? Is there a perfect square that lies within inside 12? And is there? Y'all are, are making me real sad right now. It's like breaking my heart. Is there a perfect square that lies within inside 12? What is the perfect square? Four. So that means that this can break down to being the square root of four times the square root of three. Right? Yes. <laughs> 
does that does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay. You, you just had to double check. You were still doubting Justin. She don't believe me. She didn't believe in you. She was like, what? Are you sure? All right. Square to four. So I can simplify this. Before I can ratify, it has to be in its simplest form. And the square root of 12 was not in its simplest form. So the square root of 12 becomes what actually? Perfect. Two square root of three. And my computer is going to blow up on us at some point, guys. As you can hear, we don't know when, just be prepared, okay? Now, now is our radical in its simplest form? Yes, now am I ready to ratify? And Desharmi, what were you saying we need to do to ratify? Multiply, Multiply what? Multiply the denominator. There we go. The radical in the denominator to the numerator and the, okay? Remember, this is just putting a costume on one. One is the most magical number in math. It can transform to be whatever you need it to be. It also can become Casper the friendly one and disappear, okay? So we've transformed our one and now we're ready to ratify. So negative two times the square root of three, they're not like terms, so they just become best friends. Two, and then what happens to a radical? It, it breaks itself, itself is set free, right? A radical times itself sets itself free. So we're left with two times three. So we keep simplifying. So we're left with negative two, square root of three, all over six. And is that fully simplified? Why is it not? And it's, is that really your reason? Because I wrote another equal, so you knew we weren't done? <laughs> Why is it not simplified for real though? The the negative. Um I could divide by what? What is their GCF between two and six? Two. two. So I can divide everything by two. So we're left with negative square root of three all over three. And that is our sine theta. It's taking every little bit of math knowledge that you have and applying it. Okay, which part did we not get? Okay, we're good here. Yeah. We are good, we agree. And we know they gave us our cosecant theta. So we substituted in. And then we did keep, change, split. So we keep, change, split, and we get negative two over the square root of 12. Yesterday, you know, uh, while you were warm and safe at home, we talked about ratifying the denominator, which means that you're not allowed to have a square root in the denominator, okay? To ratify, it has to be in its most simplest form, and then you're going to get rid of the square root in the denominator, okay? So going back to algebra two, the square root of 12 can be broken down into square root of four and square root of three, agree? Yes? Okay. You're with me? Did you break down the square root of four? I, I evaluated the square root of four, and what is the square root of four? Two. Okay. So like Tajani said, it came, or Johnny, I'm sorry, came two square root of three. You're just finding, three. Like the, most you're finding the perfect square mold. So like if we had 72, right? So 72 breaks down to be what? Like nine, eight. nine and eight. So square root of nine, and then square root of four, then square root of two. Oh, okay. <laughs> you want me to write it out? So if we had... So if I had 72, 72 breaks down, like you said, nine and eight, right? Yeah. So square root of nine, I can find, and then eight would break down to square root of four and square root of two. You're simplifying the root. So if I'm looking for the square root of 72, it equals, what's the square root of nine? Three, what's the square root of four? Two, and is there a square root of two? No. So in its simplest form, the square root of 72 is 6 square root of 2. Does that help? Okay, cool. Ignore this. Make sure you don't see that one. All right? So all you're doing is breaking down, then ratifying. Cool? All right. How do we feel? <laughs> I know it's taking all of your Algebra 2 skills and applying it in trig. Okay, the trick part we, we were fighting with. You're like, oh yeah, we got it. Yeah, reciprocals. But then those algebra skills we had to pull out. You're like, 
Oh, okay. Okay, she's no, like, keep no, on no. going. Oh, but yes, so you're just using those rules. We can't have a radical in the denominator. And before we get rid of it, it has to be simplified. Got it? Yes. And all we did here was dress up a one, right? Because anything divided by itself is one. So I can put it one in any kind of costume to help me simplify a problem. Okay? It's the power of manipulation with one. So you just multiply by two or two to cancel it out? Yes, to get it out of the denominator, to ratify. And you cancel the square root of three? Mm, uh, yes. Because three times three is what? And the square root of nine is three. When you're multiplying here, it's combining what's underneath the radical. Oh, okay. So three times three is nine, and the square root of three is the square root of nine is three. That's why we say a root times itself can that's it says it free. Okay. So it's gonna always come back. All right. Okay, that's gonna be the hardest part here. No, we understand the reciprocal rules. We just have to be comfortable with our algorithm. Got it? All right, here we go. Now we're gonna be talking about um quadrant rules. So we know that in a quadrant, there are four quadrants and it looks better in the other form, but this is the sign of function table that everyone shows their trade students, okay? What it's telling you is when things are positive. In quadrant one, every single trig ratio is positive. Do you see that? So no matter what, it's gonna produce a positive value. In quadrant two, um, the only positive trig ratios that you have are sine and cosecant. Okay, in quadrant three, the only positive trig values you have are tan and cotangent. And in quadrant four, all you're gonna have is cosine and secant. Okay, and we're going to explain better looking at another graphic, okay? I would strongly suggest you writing the quadrant graphic then this table down, which is how it helped me memorize it better. So not this one. I would do this one, okay? So in quadrant one, all functions are positive. Everybody, that's my A, everybody is positive. In quadrant two, only sine and cosecant are positive. And that's because when we talk about in terms of ordered pairs, these are our X's and Y's. And in quadrant one, your X's and Y's are what? Positive. In quadrant two, that's when you have a negative X and a positive Y. And sine is our y, and that's why it's always positive. In quadrant three, tangent and cotangent. So your tangent and it's reciprocal. And that's because negative x and negative y. And we learned our rules yesterday, x over y, y over x. A negative divided by a negative is always going to be a positive. And in quadrant four, it's cosine and it's reciprocal. And that's because your X's are positive and your Y's are negative. So when you look at an ordered pair, it's X comma Y, which translates to becoming cosine comma sine. And how do I remember this? Well, my teacher told us, all students take calculus. Okay, all students. If all functions are positive, all quadrant one students sign and it's reciprocal are positive. I guess we don't think that how we're gonna do this is it positive or negative? Is the okay. trig value positive or negative? Tangent and it's reciprocal. Cosine and it's reciprocal. So what they're gonna give you. They're just going to ask, is the sine negative or positive? Yeah, so it's a sine, positive for angle, blah, blah, blah. It's a cosine, positive for blah, blah, blah. Depending on where it falls. Does it fall in quadrant one, which is from zero to 90? Does it fall in quadrant two, from 90 to 180? Depending on which one you're asking. It depends on the problem. Okay. All right, so again, to me, it's better to look at this in the table. And I just remember all students take calculus. And yeah. All right, are we ready to see an example, Justin, so that you can see why and how? Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, so up first, we have 87 degrees, right? So 87 degrees falls in what quadrant? One. So 87 degrees is going to be in quadrant one. And so in quadrant one, what are the signs of its trig values? They're, what would be the sign, positive or negative, for all the trig values? They're going to all be all positive trig values. That means sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent are going to all be positive because it falls in what quadrant? Quadrant one. Okay? 300 degrees. What quadrant does 300 degrees fall in? It falls in quadrant four. Yes. We start at zero. We go 90. We go another 90. We go another 90 and we come back, right? So 300 falls in what quadrant? Four. And it wants to identify what are they in four? Well, we can't say all are positive in four, can we? What is positive in four? Cosine and secant. Positive. Only. Or cosine and secant theta. Right now, I just want to make sure you can identify when things are positive and negative. Okay. Okay. All right, your turn without me. Going backwards now, right? You want to remember how to turn it into a positive? There we go. So if I'm if I'm a negative, to turn it into a positive. Do you think that rotation? Yeah. This would be nice. This is the same thing. It goes this way, remember? Clockwise. Zero. And you're making 90 degree turns. Oh, wait. You don't remember. You weren't here yesterday. Yeah. 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 Perfect. All right. So to find out what quadrant negative 200 adds, I need to make it positive. How did we talk about making it positive last week? We got to find its coterminal, and we find its coterminal by adding 360. Genius, as I tell you. So, what is my coterminal? What y'all No, okay. Well, quadrant of man, then. I'm in quadrant two. So in quadrant two, what is my positive? Only positives. Only positives. Sine theta and cosecant theta. How do we feel about identifying the quadrants of positivity? Doable? Just as how we feel. Better? Yeah. All right. Okay, so we're going to take up a notch. Now I want you to identify the quadrant. Okay, so now we're going to identify the quadrant given this information. So remembering, again, I like to remember all students take calculus. I write it on everything, and my brain is there. Okay, so we're looking for a quadrant where sine theta is. 
<laughs> sine theta is positive, right? So we're looking for sine theta is positive, and tan theta is negative. So what quadrant is that? It would be quadrant two. You're geniuses. Good job. Okay. If I'm greater than zero, that means positive, right? So I'm looking for when sine is positive. If I'm less than zero, then I am negative. So first, I identify the only quadrant where sine can be positive outside of quadrant one, which is two. All right, next one. This time, we're looking for a negative cosine theta and a negative secant theta. And where else? Two and three. It'll be quadrant two and quadrant three. Cosecant and secant are what to each other? They go together, right? They're reciprocals. So if cosine is a negative somewhere, so it's secant, right? And they're both negative here. Oh, that's cosine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cosine is only positive in quadrants one and quadrant two. So therefore, if we're looking for when is it negative in quadrant four, I'm sorry, it's going to be in quadrants two and quadrant three. So your negative is right, you said? Your X's are. Okay, other thing to remember is cosine basically means you're looking at your X's. And it's asking when is X negative. And the only time you get a negative X is in quadrant two and in quadrant three. Yeah. Are we good? Questions, comments, concerns? Pos We're good on positivity and negativity. All right, cool. Um, okay, so the values. How do you know if you're getting the right values when you're evaluating trade functions? Well, there are some rules to follow. So sine and cosine can only lie between negative one and one. If you do sine and cosine and somehow your value is bigger than negative, smaller than negative one or bigger than one, you did something wrong, okay? For any angle, the sine and cosine values will only lie between negative one and one, okay? For tangent and cotangent, it's infinite, okay? Your tangent and cotangent can be big. It goes on forever. It's infinite possibility. Okay. Secant and cosecant can be anything but one and negative one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're evaluating, you get weird numbers and it doesn't fit in these categories, then that lets you know that some type of error was made. Make sense? These are their range for their functions. So if we were to graph them, um, you would see where, where the functions do weird things or go on forever. Sign can be positive or negative. It's saying that it can't be bigger. So your output, so your x's, so your x value can be positive or negative, right? Any number, no matter how big your degree is. But your range, finding the actual sign value, cannot be small, um, smaller than negative one or bigger than positive one. Or when you're evaluating. So we're going to... Evaluate here. So for example, if I told you that the sine of um, an angle equals 2.5, is it a true or false statement? Why is it false? It's bigger than one. So this person did something wrong. So automatically I'm like, uh, no, impossible, impossible. Okay, and that's because sine theta is greater than one. Okay. okay, get it? Okay, now, is this possible? 
This is possible. Why is it possible? It's infinite. It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Secant theta, 0. 0.6. Impossible. Why is it impossible? It can't be between negative one and one. So the values can't be between negative one and one. And is this value between them? Yeah. Make sense? Okay, that's what knowing the range restriction lets you know whether the answer is right or wrong. Cool? All right. So. <laughs> suppose that the angle theta is in quadrant two. So we know we're in quadrant two and the sine theta equals two over three. Find the values of the other trig functions. So the first thing we know is that we're in quadrant two. So we're here. And because we're in quadrant two, uh, this is telling us our ratio. So remembering our ratios, we know that sine theta equals y over r. Agree? So here we are at three. And our radius is, we're at two and our radius is three. But what do we not know? Our x. So we don't know our x. So we have to find out where x value to do the other trig ratio, trig values. Does that make sense? But we do know that our x is negative because it's in quadrant two. Yeah? All right. So we have two squared plus x squared equals three squared. So we get x squared equals nine plus four, not, I'm sorry, not plus four, nine minus four. And nine minus four is five. So therefore x equals the square root of five. And our x has to be what? Cause it's in quadrant two, negative. So x equals negative square root of five. So now we have the value of our x, so we get negative square root of five. Can I find cosecant, cosine? Okay. Okay, yeah. We can find them all, right? Well, so cosecant theta. Okay. Um, yeah. That one's the easiest one, right? Three over, because they're what again? Reciprocals. Now we're gonna do our cosine theta. Cosine theta equals negative square root of five over, over three. And then tan theta equals uh, three over um, two. No. Y over R. I mean, y over X, I'm sorry. Remember, tan theta is y over x. What's our y? 2. And what's our x? Negative square root of? Because it's in quadrant 2, your x's have to be negative, right? Okay, now we're going to do the reciprocals. Well, we need to simplify this. Is this in simple form? It is not. So in simple form, this becomes two, negative two square root of five over five. And why is that? I have to multiply. I have to multiply the numerator and denominator by what? By itself, by the radical, square root of five. All right. What is the reciprocal of this guy? Secant theta equals negative three over the square root of five. Is that in the correct form? Nope. What are we doing? Our brains. We got to multiply by the the radical. So we end up with negative three square root of five over five. 
And then the reciprocal here is going to be cotangent theta. And we get negative square root of five over two because it's the reciprocal of that guy. Oh, okay, okay. Yes? Okay. Do we? They match with the script then? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we have cosecant is three halves. Cosine is negative five thirds. Secant theta is negative three square root of five over five. Tangent is negative two square root of five over five. And then cotangent is negative fives over two. Yes. All right. Uh, 